chat. I don't have an R markdown prepared uh, to go through for chapter six. I mean, I after going through chapter five, it was pretty lengthy. Exactly. So I think we focus on that. Uh, I've already committed to doing chapter six. So um, we'll just review chapter six next week. I'll I'll take care of that one. Okay. So uh, are you okay adding that or do you want me to add, um, add that to the list uh, for presentation next week? Your name on the Excel yeah, list. I, I, yeah, let's add my name for chapter six next week. So change the, the ordering of uh, the chapters, all right? We're going to push things back a little bit since we'll... Uh, it, chapter it, six next week. It hasn't. Um, it wasn't reflected. So the fourteenth was already okay. chapter six. So there's no need uh, to make any schedule changes. Um, I will take the twenty first. Uh, so at least we have two weeks out. Um, as you're looking through the topics and materials, if there's something that stands out, feel free to move forward. I. Um, think that like. It's a good it's a good idea to focus on this because it did bring up a lot. It went through a lot of things and it's very important as he went through it. And then next week, if, if it's a shorter chapter, which it looked like but still important, we can maybe factor in some more time into like some of the practicals or the examples or the uh, homework questions. Any other topics or anything anyone wants to go over before we learn knowledge from Aaron? I'll just say I, I did not watch the videos this week. Uh, were they were they worthwhile? I uh, only read the text this week. Yeah, and I somehow between walking in two rooms, I lost the book, so I'm using the ebook for today's talk. All right, uh, yeah, let's get started. I will share my screen. Here we go. Actually, uh, what do you see? Do you just see the, the book down document? Chapter five identification. Yeah. Is it too big, too small, just right? Works for me. Okay. Very good. Uh, so welcome everybody, uh, data science learning community book club. We are cohort one of the book, The Effect. And today we are gonna review chapter five uh, entitled Identification. This chapter, as I mentioned uh, at the start of this meeting, it was, was kind of lengthy. Uh, we don't get into the weeds in terms of method methodological uh, details, uh, you know, statistical procedures, et cetera. Uh, the focus here is really uh, a broad conceptual overview of how we conduct research when we're dealing with observational data. Uh, and so as part of that conceptual understanding, uh, the author goes through some, some key terms that we'll talk about in just a minute here. One of those being data generating process. What is that? It's important to understand that uh, to engage uh, in causal research. Um, then we deal with uh, variation, right? The data varies for a variety of reasons. How do we get to the right variation to answer the research question of interest? Um, and then the, the process of teasing out the, the correct variation is called identification, which is, again, the, the, the title of this chapter. And uh, we'll go through multiple examples, some of them being fictitious, contrived examples that are, you know, pre pretty goofy. Uh, there's also a really interesting one later in the chapter about uh, alcohol and mortality based on a real large scale study. Uh, so looking forward to t having a having a good discussion about that in particular. Um, so that's that's the broad overview of what we're what we're going to talk about today. Any questions or comments at this point? Okay, let's jump into it with uh, the data generating process or DGP for short. So, so we open the chapter uh, with this basic premise that underlies a lot of science and scientific research, which is that, you know, there are certain laws uh, that govern how the world works 
and and those laws could be physical laws uh or social uh type type laws right uh, about how the, how the world operates the example in the book comes from physics uh, uh about you know the force between two two different objects I believe it uses is an equation involving the mass of the two objects how far apart they are and a gravitational constant so this is just a universal law right of, of the force between these these two objects uh key point is that these laws operate regardless if, if we know much about them or not um, it's the underlying reality and in most cases we learn about these laws through empirical observation uh right that's that's why uh we engage in research whether you know we're uh in the physical or social science sciences um yeah, we 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 engage in research to under to um, uncover these these underlying laws. And uh, one more point is that <laughs> for a lot of social research, which I think we're all kind of involved with to, to some degree, is 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 these laws are not uh, quite as well behaved as we see in the physical science sciences. I think about Hooke's law in physics, which is just kind of this linear. Uh, uh, equation, right, where force is uh, proportional to distance, right? So that's that's something that's that's kind of precise, um, you know. But again, I, I work in insurance, and if I'm trying to predict for an individual, I may have uh, a type of regression model to predict how much a claims cost would be in the in a following period. Uh, you know, we we tend to use metrics like R squared. <laughs> to gauge how accurate our models are. And, and so in the social sciences, or at least in my field, right, an R squared of 25% may be a good, <laughs> a good model. Um, but if you're talking physics, uh, that's probably going to be awful, right, where you want to have something closer to 100%. Um, curious about, uh, you know, folks here, like, particularly if you're dealing with like a regression type problem, you know, is, is a 25% you know, R squared level good in your field. Again, it it, it can be in, in my field. Yeah, I feel like in my field, they don't really care about the R squared as much because it is about processes that are in society where we know that there's a hundred thousand other things that influence it, but we're interested in that one specific thing we're having a look at. So it doesn't matter if there's other things that explain it as well. We just want to know if this one does explain it too. Right. That, so that kind of gets at the heart of you are trying to identify the why of the matter. Whereas for a lot of my work, it's it's about prediction only. So the R squared is is kind of an, an important metric, right? That we would use. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, just are you going to say something, John? Go ahead. Yes, like kind of from the more on the introductory and the like business analytics, data analytics, it's often where you'll see that positive or negative relationship and people will say, oh, basically what you said that as prices go up, people buy less avocados. Like that, that's like the analysis or the answer and realizing that there's another step you have to take and understanding that that doesn't actually tell you that. It just tells you that they seem to be related in that type of direction. Yeah, that that that's right. Right, the the high level view of the data doesn't necessarily answer the the question you're you're after. All right, so uh, in this first section, the author talks about two parts of DGPs. Uh, there's there's the part that you already understand, uh, or you're just making assumptions based on, I don't know, universal knowledge, prior research, uh, etc. And then there's that second part, uh, which is the unknown part that you're you're seeking to identify through your research. Uh, as I read through this, I thought maybe you know is this a little too simple? Uh, you know, there's that that matrix out there that talks about like known knowns and uh, <laughs> unknown unknowns, for instance. And so I would think this explanation kind of uh, avoids the unknown unknowns. Right. So, so we, we, 
according to this simple logic, there are the known knowns that kind of hit our, you know, that, that are part of our uh, data generating process that we, we try to depict in like a causal diagram. Uh, and then there's that part we, we still don't understand that we're trying to answer through re research. And that's sort of a known unknown. But there are always those unknown unknowns, right? That could be distorting your answer, um, right? That that also means when you're doing observational research, you can never be quite sure that you're you're getting a definitive answer, right? Because there's the, all these variables out there, and you'll never be able to control for all of them. And you may not even know, even if you are able to control for all the variables. Um, you maybe don't know what that entire universe is. Uh, right to to answer the the question of interest. I, I was surprised that he didn't explicitly say in there. He said in early chapters about does it like does it even matter? Is it worth the time to get those? Like if you're close enough to a certain degree, like that is good enough for a lot of use cases and stuff. But it, it does. But I just I, it was interesting about the lack of that direct comment uh, about the you know. It's not feasible to do that or worth the time, kind of like what he had outlined in the, I think it was chapter two about designing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's always a, <laughs> you're always going to want perfection. You're never going to get there. And at the end of the day, we, we have time constraints and you need to put your pencils down at some point, right? So you, you do what you can uh, given the, the amount of time that you have. All right, so the first example in this chapter is, is pretty goofy. It's a contrived example. And so we lay out a few laws about how the world works, and we, we, we try to uncover those, those, those laws uh, under a couple circumstances. One, assuming we, we don't really know anything about those laws, and we just look at the data. And then under a different set of circumstances where we understand most of the the laws, and then we can uncover uh, this this piece of, of of the underlying mechanism that that we're trying to understand. And so I'll just rattle off the, these laws and, and the, the example. Uh, one is that income is log normally distributed. That doesn't sound too unrealistic, right? We we know that income is is heavily skewed, right skewed. Uh, the the other is that brown hair causes a ten percent uh, increase to your income. Uh, which is pretty goofy, right? Uh, it, the author is probably having a fun time with this one. Uh, and then the other one, maybe more realistic, is that a college degree produces a 20% increase to your to your income. Uh, and, and then there are a few other underlying assumptions uh, that govern how the world works. One is that 20% of the population have brown hair naturally. Only 30% of, of folks in the population have college degrees. And then of the folks that have neither natural brown hair nor college degrees, 40% uh, will dye their hair brown. Again, kind of a, a goofy uh, assumption there, but it, it works for this example. So if we are trying to understand the relationship between brown hair and income, but we don't understand any, any of those laws we just rattled off, we, we could just look at the data here as a histogram, right? Where we're plotting brown hair versus non-brown hair, looking at, at log income and trying to see if there, there are any patterns here. Just looking at the, the histogram itself, it's, it's pretty difficult to be honest with you. Um, you know, those histograms are, are fairly tightly um, placed on top of each other. But if we, we just, take a table of log income broken out by brown hair and, and non-brown hair, we, we do see a small difference there. Uh, it, it ends up being the equivalent of, of about 1.6% uh, higher income for, for brown hair versus other colors. Uh, that's problematic because we, we, we've we already stated ahead of time that we know uh, that brown hair causes, uh, what was it, a 10%? Yeah, a 10% boost to your income, and we're only seeing a little over 1%. Uh, 
so so what's going on here uh the the problem is there are other variables at at, at play that we're not controlling for um again in, in in causal research land we use terms like confounders uh and some of the one of those confounding variables of course is is um having a college degree doing a high level cut of the data doesn't give us that you know does not control for for the college um, degree uh, variable that that does influence the result that we're seeing. And then we also have this strange phenomenon where the uh, the non college educated folks may dye their hair also to uh, to get presumably get a <laughs> get an income boost there. And so that leads us to this this premise too, I'm calling it, where we understand that relationship with college degrees and higher income, and we know that non-college students tend to dye their hair. So what we can do to control for, for those uh, other relationships influencing income is, is just narrow the scope of the data that we're reviewing. Um, and so in this case, we'll just exclude the non-college educated, right? Th that that has the benefit of removing uh, the, the dying dying of one's hair, um, and it removes the the influence of college education on income. So we're we're getting a purer signal, presumably by by looking at just the uh, the college educated folks. And so when we do that, uh, we get a much stronger uh, relationship. Uh, looking at the the log income here, um, in this example, there it's a thirteen percent uh, difference between the the brown hair and the, the non brown haired folks. Uh, we know that in reality, because we've contrived the example that the, the true relationship is ten percent. But in reality, you know, da data is noisy, so you, you'll never really expect to get the, the true value um, spot on, right? Um, but that does get us closer to reality here. Hopefully, I've, I've explained that fairly well. Any, any questions or additional commentary on, on that example? Okay, and then just as a, a preview, this this gets us to those ideas that I mentioned earlier on about variation, right? We we want to tease out the 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 variation to answer the research question of interest. Again, that that process is called identification, which is what um, is the core idea of this week. John already alluded to this particular example with avocado prices, uh, so we. We, we take this example, uh, I guess this was some sort of study looking at um, prices of, and, and uh, the sale, the, sorry, quantity demanded against price uh, of avocados in California over, uh, you know, a few years here. And that brings us to a few questions about what we can infer from this data. Uh, but before we get into this, I, I, I'm going to ask Sarah, because she's the uh, economist of the group, why do economists <laughs> tend to plot things uh, differently than what we're seeing here, where price would be on the y-axis and uh, avocados sold on the x-axis? Because that seems very different than what a statistician would do. And I feel like my field's closer to you know more of what a traditional statistician would do. That's a really good question. I have no idea. I mean, unless... The endogenous variable is the price. Then it would make sense. So if you if you do like an inverse function, yada yada thing, but I think you can just do it both ways. It depends on which one you're focused on. Right is my yeah. best guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I always think exogenous x-axis, endogenous y-axis. Uh, uh, but you know, just thinking back to introductory economics it's usually shown the, the other way but you you can still interpret the plot obviously but it's just uh one of those things <laughs> we do in our own domains right we have our own own ways of doing things all right so 
uh, you know, I'll open this up to the group again. You know, what can we infer from this this graph, um, if if anything? I'm going to pick on John. That there is a relationship in the movement between total avocados sold and average avocado price. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. Uh, I think there's a tendency, and, and certainly when I look at this, I, I, I go there in my, my head as well, in, is in that, well, price is causing, higher prices are causing uh, a lower quantity sold of, of the avocados, right? I mean, I think intuitively we want to do that. We want to <laughs> attribute cause and effect, even if it, it doesn't really exist. But to your point, John, and as mentioned in, in the book, um, what we're really seeing is just a statistical relationship here. Like the co there is covariance or correlation um, between, between these two variables. And so then there's a second question, like what, what research questions might we produce from this chart? I think the obvious one is that cause and effect relationship, right? Like about if we change our prices, how does that impact the the quantity sold? If if we are a seller of avocados, we we might want to understand that. Any other uh, questions that might we might think of just just through this particular example? Maybe Any more of a heterogeneity exercise, but like having a look at how this relationship differs depending on whether the avocados are organic or not. So like mm. if that kind of stuff makes a difference and we could see different graphs. Yeah, that's a really good one that I I didn't think about, the heterogeneity of it, right? So yeah, there's a pattern that exists on a broad scale, but once you slice and dice, uh, you may have very different results. Um, I can't say that I, I came up with with great questions on my own that weren't addressed in the in the book. John, Federica, I mean, you guys have any interesting sure. research questions that you thought of? Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, like on the business side of it as well, this also could open up a bit of like, are these like the same size avocados types or grades or whatever? Uh, that you know, as well as you know, any kind of seasonal things like if this was you know, uh, Super Bowl or uh, uh, things, but again, that's all the stuff that can come from this. But there are some other ways that at least initially say, "Hey, there's a relationship here worth pursuing to figure out." What's next, instead of saying, "Yeah, that's kind of what I got from." Yep. Okay. Well, very good. And. Uh, Frederick, I mentioned in the chat about the uh, influence of time with the prices as well. Time is interesting, right? I feel like there are a lot of poor conclusions drawn by looking at patterns over time, right? And making associations, these, these spurious, the spurious uh, correlations. I was trying to think of an example in preparation this week. Like you, you could probably look at a graph of what you know what percentage just what it was getting interesting uh aaron i don't know if you can hear us but your audio went out yeah i can't hear you either i don't think you can hear us oh um i'll write something in chat thank you and yeah, this is a great sounding uh example too we're missing out Okay, he just saw that. Yeah, I like to basically what he was uh, getting to here was basically the concept of it. Keep everything else essentially uh, constant. What would this relationship be built up?
Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Okay. Uh, wow. So I guess my, my Bluetooth headset just uh, crapped down on us here. Uh, so I'm using my laptop now. What, what, <laughs> what was the last thing that you guys heard? An example that I was about uh, that I can think of is, and then you presented like the entire example. We couldn't hear anything past what you were going to start from. Man, uh, all right, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll quickly go through it. Just just about spurious correlations. I mean, we, we brought up you know plotting things over time, and I was thinking about uh, oh, percentage of the population that plays video games over time, maybe from like the seventies through today. If you overlaid uh, that with obesity rates uh, from the 70s, kind of a similar relationship where video game playing rates go up over time, obesity rates right, uh, are up over time, you might erroneously conclude that, that the cause of uh, the increase in obesity rates is because more people are playing video games, right? Um, I, I just think that's kind of the can can canonical example of, of where folks draw conclusions, uh, causal conclusions where they're not necessarily um, there. Okay, well, that was a, a fun example and uh, glad I went through it for a couple minutes before I realized that you guys couldn't hear me. Sorry, we, we tried and realized you couldn't hear us, so that's where we went to the chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate you <laughs> calling it out. Uh, I was on a roll there. Okay, uh, you know, to to um, you know your point earlier, John, we we can't really conclude that there's a causal relationship with this avocado example. There's just a, merely a statistical relationship. Um, Yes, we, we cannot say that the increase in avocado prices caused lower sales. There's also an interaction between supply and demand that influences price. So that's an extra layer of complexity um, that certainly is not being controlled by just looking at this bivariate plot. Uh, and then in the chapter, there's a few other research questions that are suggested here. You know what? What is the effect of price on the number of avocados brought to the the market? Uh, there's a temporal effect of quantity demanded from the previous week to the subsequent week, and uh, a couple others here um, that we don't really need to focus on here. But um, certainly, um, we can probably come up with a, a lot of different questions here. I thought Sarah's uh, question about you know involving heterogeneity. Uh, uh, was, was a really good one there. And the question, can we answer our research question based on this simple bivariate plot? Uh, you know, in most cases, the answer is going to be no. And so then we, we get into the data generating process with this example. How do we isolate the variation that we're interested in? And so let's assume going forward that what we're trying to uh, identify is uh, the effect of price on demand for avocados. And to do that, we need to have some prior knowledge about that data generating process, or we need to have some, some good assumptions uh, to really make that causal inference there. And, and so to get there, in this case, we, we make the simplifying assumption that the avocado suppliers are setting their prices at the beginning of each month. And so they, they, they are varying the prices uh, each week, potentially, within a given month. But those variances are not caused by um, ex, you know, any, any other factor. So it's truly exogenous within a given month, right? They, they're already saying, Week one, this is what I'm going to charge. Week two, this is what I'm going to charge, uh, right? And so there are not no other factors at play causing price changes within a given month. Uh, and so if we can make that simplifying assumption, uh, we can get to the, the heart of the matter, which again is the cause and effect relationship between 
uh, price of avocados and the um, amount demanded. Uh, hopefully I've explained that right. Any, any other commentary on, on that? And so we have this, this, this chart here that is showing you price and quantity demanded within two different months here, February, 2015, March, 2015. Um, you can see that there still is uh, that negative relationship between price and quantity sold. Uh, but again, because we've made this assumption uh, uh, within the data generating process and, and assuming that's a good assumption, um, we're now able to um, establish that this causal relationship whereas before we, we could not. Okay, uh, moving on to the next section, uh, identification, which is gets to the heart of the matter again, isolating that part of variation that answers the, the research question of interest. This section starts with a, a really <laughs> long-winded example uh, involving uh, a dog, uh, right? Uh, that's living with family, uh, Annie and Abel, I believe are the two owners name, names. And the dog is escaping the house each night. Uh, the owners wanna understand how, how the dog is, is escaping. Annie hypothesizes early on that, well, we, we think, it, she thinks it could be the basement window. And so to, to, to get, to answer this hypothesis, to test the hypothesis, what, what the owners do is they roll out other alternative explanations. And so they, they go about this in a sequ sequential fashion by, by doing different experiments really each night. First, they start by just uh, closing the, the doggy door, uh, which is one possible escape hatch for Rex. Then the next night they close both the doggy door and the back door of the house. You know, they, they double bolt the back door or something, something to that effect. The next night they, they address the blinds and then the other two items that we just talked about and so on and so forth, uh, where they're adding additional possible escape hatches each night, um, where the, until they reach a point where the only other possible explanation is the basement window, which has been left open throughout the course of, of um, you know, this really, it's, it's kind of experimentation here. Um, and so because we've rolled out or the owners have rolled out all of the other possible explanations, the only possibility is, is that Rex is uh, escaping through, through the basement window. Question for the group here, why did the owners do the experiment in, in this fashion? Why didn't they just do everything but the uh, but the basement window in one night, as opposed to uh, the sequential fashion where they're, where they're doing this over multiple nights and just adding, uh, rolling out additional you know escape hatches, if you will, each each night? Couldn't couldn't we just do this in one fell swoop? It seemed like there's a little bit of ego. Um, like, I don't want to be wrong, so I'm going to try everything else. Uh, but also, if depending on the, the window, if it's higher up, it seems like that would be a less ob uh, obvious way to get out than, say, a doggy door or a back door. I don't know what the blinds had to do with things, but um, you know, that's also another thing. Is But it does seem to go with you. Know, if you have outside information, like maybe she already knew that it was going to be um, how we have the dog got out, that would sense to use that. But if I didn't know any prior information, I would assume having the door uh, unlocked open or something like that would be more likely than you know a window kind of higher up in the basement that the dog could get out of. Here's another question. Assuming you know the sequential way that that the, this experiment, for lack of a better term, uh, was conducted, 
why was it done in a sequential or cumulative fashion rather? And by that I mean like we why didn't we just or why didn't the owners just do the doggy door on one and then just the back door in night two, uh, blinds in night three, etc. Because the door uh, or the dog could then decide to change which way it escapes, right? Um, yeah. So we have to close up everything but one thing. But then yeah. I'm not quite sure if we actually can know that the first time that we didn't do this experiment, the dog was actually escaping through the basement window because it might have been that he escaped through the doggy door, right? But then he decided, oh, well, it's closed now, so I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah, I, 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 that's a really good point. And, and I think that gets to the heart of the matter where this is a pretty simplified example. Um, and just because you close the doggy door on night one and let's say that the, the dog didn't escape, well, maybe the, maybe the dog still knows how to open the doggy door and just chose not to on a given, given night. So you kind of need to do, have repeated observations over time. Uh, to get to the, the heart of the matter, right? Uh, and then at the end of this, you know, they, they never actually closed the basement window. <laughs> you notice that at the end, they just assumed, well, we've exhausted every possibility. It has to be the basement window. But if, if this were my own dog uh, escaping, I'd probably want to check that as well. Because do I really know the entire universe of possibilities? of how the, the dog could escape? Probably not. I, I might have a good idea, but like really there, there, there could be things that I, I just haven't considered yet. So that would be my critique of, of how this was, was conducted here is I, I go that extra step at least to say like, well, let's, let's do another night here and also <laughs> close off the basement window. Uh, but it, it's still a very uh, elucidating example, right? The idea is that we are controlling for other explanations, closing off these these potential uh, uh, alternative explanations here, uh, so that we're we're really rolling out everything else. Basement window has to be uh, the the reason why. So we are establishing uh, cause and effect uh, relationship here. So then if we, we step back, there's there's a broad process that we take to um, uh, identify the, 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 the problem at hand, right? Usually we, we start with a, a theory, an overall theory in, informed probably by prior research, prior knowledge, domain expertise, et cetera. We need a testable hypothesis um, and the identification process starts with that hypothesis, uh, applies it to data, right? And we need to do so in a way that we are going for these alternative explanations. So in the dog, Rex, uh, hit the example here, the, you know, Annie, the owner assumed her hypothesis was that the dog was in fact escaping through the basement window. And so the identification process is involved removing all of those other possibilities, the, the back door, the chimney, doggy door, et cetera, isolating the only remaining possibility, which was the, the basement window. So in a practical situation in a research study, you know, what we're typically doing to control uh, for these alternative explanations is uh, we're applying statistical procedures. Um, I can't say I'm an expert in all of these, but I, I do know that in a lot of cases, you know, you're, you're running a regression analysis and one way you can control for these alternative uh, variables or alternative ex um, explainers, if you will, is, is by just including, you know, multiple covariates in your regression analysis, right? So we call those again, confounders. Um, and that way you can kind of get to the, the heart of the matter. Uh, but you don't, you, you can't answer your question with statistical procedures uh, alone. Uh, you still need to have some underlying theory uh, and assumptions about how the data generating process works. 
And so here we have just a few steps uh, about how we would go about answering a research question. First, you, you have to have theory uh, to describe that data generating process. Then um, we use our knowledge of the DGP uh, to find reasons why the data appear the, the way that it is um, that, that does not address the research question of interest. So we are trying to identify those confounders, uh, alternative explanations, controlling for those. Um, and once we've blocked out those alternative explanations, uh, we have isolated the, the variation that we're truly interested in. And again, that's, that, that is the, the high level process that we engage in, it's called identification. Anything else that I maybe missed or comments on the overall identification process? Okay, so uh, the next section it deals with a real life example. I'm really glad that, that this one was uh, addressed. I think in our first session, we, we talked about this idea which is that for many years, uh, uh, there was yeah, out there that uh, drinking one or two glasses of wine, for instance, each day may actually improve uh, health, right? Maybe it leads to lower mortality. Uh, but a well-publicized study that came out in 2018 came to a different conclusion, which is that any level really or a minimum level of alcohol consumption, about a, a drink per day, uh, has negative implications in terms of mortality. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, interesting facts about this study. One, it had, I guess, over 200 contributors, which is insane. Uh, and the, the population that was studied uh, involved 600,000 people. Uh, so, you know, sample size isn't really an issue here. It was also published in a well-regarded medical journal, uh, The Lancet. And the results of the study were also taken very seriously. Uh, I think some, some countries used this study in particular to revise drinking guidelines. I, I think in the US, I, I, there's still this idea that, you know, for men, it's maybe a couple drinks a day or for three miles, one drink a day. I, I'm not hundred percent sure. I'm not an expert on that, but I, I do recall that being, you know, baseline, like, Hey, this is, you know, we don't recommend any more than this. Uh, I don't, I don't know if the U S has, has revised, uh, their guidelines, uh, as a result of this particular study, Sarah in, in Germany, for instance, what do you know, like what the drinking guidelines are? The suggestions by you know the various um guessing they're groups. quite high because we have a very active beer lobby um mm, yeah and in one of the states for the longest time there was actually no like alcohol tax on beer because it was considered to be like a basic good that everybody needs so i'm, I'm guessing it's not in the line of this study <laughs> Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Uh, wow. Yeah, so <laughs> we definitely have a, a tax on alcohol here, right? It's kind of a vice tax. Um, yeah, so it sounds like in, in Germany, that probably doesn't exist. And uh, yeah, guidelines probably are not like, don't drink. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I live in Chicago, by the way, and I, I think of Milwaukee, which is a, a fairly close city to Chicago, geographically speaking, and, and that is a, a beer city. A lot of famous beers were at least originally made there, and um, yeah, I think that uh, the locals, they would not take kindly decisions that uh, you want to not, not drink at all. It certainly would hurt the, uh, the industry overall. All right. Um, and so we, we have a, a basic understanding about the study, what the findings were. So as, as an exercise, we're asked to list items that would cause uh, someone to drink or, or maybe just items that are related to drinking. Uh, and then 
lists some things that are related to dying, right? What like what would cause someone to die or be related to dying or mortality? And then is there any overlap between these lists? So again, I'm going to open this up to the group. You know, uh, you know what what would cause someone to drink? And and one thing that wasn't mentioned in the book that I'll just point out here is you know we can think of mental health, right? Maybe someone has severe anxiety and instead of taking prescription medication, um, they use alcohol as a way to, to medicate uh, for that anxiety. Anyone think of anything interesting that, that maybe wasn't addressed in the, in, the, in the book? Maybe something else would be whether or not you enjoy going to parties or just generally social hangouts because it's very, or it, 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 a lot of them, it's socially unacceptable to not drink. Yeah, that's a good point. Right. I mean, it, alcohol is associated with with social behavior. Yeah, so just maybe it's not necessarily cause and effect, but it, there's definitely an association there. Absolutely. John, you were you were saying? Oh, sorry. I I, I didn't realize you were still talking. I think there was a delay in my audio. Um, I was going to say, yeah, focus on the negative reasons why people would drink, but it also didn't really go into the positive things like parties and celebrations, good news, um, which I'm assuming would break down like the type of drinking or how much drinking they would do one way or the other. Um, and then, yeah, uh, so I, 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 I think that was one area that I would look, was look at too, because it seems like drinking for bad versus like evil drinking for bad reasons versus drinking for good reasons or happy or you know, celebratory reasons there's other factors going on with uh, other things that have seemed to be shown like positive attitude or smiling and laughing more versus isolation or whatever it's going through on the other way yeah yeah that's a, that's a really good point uh, and again, there's just something I, I didn't really consider as I was thinking through this problem. Uh, another thing, particularly in the U.S., because we have this drinking age of 21, <laughs> there's a tendency to, when you're in college, right, when you're around that, that drinking age, when you're away from your parents, where it's generally not encouraged to drink, at, you know, <laughs> at home while you're still under your parents' roof, and there's a tendency to, to really overdo it. When you go to university um so i think there's an association there as well um and we'll get to this but age was something that was controlled for in this this study but i, I do think there's a, an association there as well um and how about more mortality i mean i, I think this one's a, a little bit more broad right there's <laughs> many ways we die uh right at the end of the day we, we all die um you know, it could be of natural causes or unnatural causes, um, right? Cancer, heart attack. Uh, there, there, there's all, all kinds of things that that, that happen, um, but it's inevitable that we all die uh, at some point. I think the, the book addresses, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move this along. Um, numerous indicators of bad health, right? Uh, smoking uh, is, is the, the prime example that they talk about here where you might drink because you smoke or, or rather those, those things are, are tend to be associated with other and are indicative of just risk-taking behavior uh, in, in general. And smoking is one of those things too that um, there's a social element to that as well uh, for the site for, for, for drinking. And there's, uh, in terms of overlap here, um, smoking is, is certainly uh, the prime example brought up here, where we, we know uh, through many years, many decades of research that smoking does uh, increase your likelihood of mortality, right? Particularly through, through cancer and other, other um, diseases. Um, and so, so there's a, a association both with drinking and mortality. And because of that, uh, establishing the cause and effect relationship between drinking and mortality is not so straightforward. So we have this confounding relationship here with, with smoking. Uh, 
Um, again, so any any item that you can bucket on both lists as a cause of drinking or an association with drinking and an association with mortality um, means you have an alternate alternative explanation uh, for, for what's driving mortality. Uh, another question uh, that's brought up is, is like, what about non-drinkers? Um, you know, people who don't drink may actually have higher mortality than drink because they're already sick, that they have some conditions that prevent them from really drinking at all. Um, and then in the population of non-drinkers, you have folks that used to be heavy drinkers were are now recovering alcoholics. Those folks may also, you know, not be particularly well uh, compared to the, the average person in the population. Um, so, so these are issues again, which which may distort, uh, you, you know, the ability to, to cleanly associate to, to attribute cause and effect um, between drinking and and mortality. So, in this particular study, uh, the authors removed non-drinkers entirely, which uh, alleviates that issue we just talked about with, with non-drinkers, right? Where they could, they could be sicker than the average. Uh, Do you know person. how they figured out an effect then? Do they check out drinkers that stop drinking? That's a good question. I I don't get the A plus this week for actual <laughs> I'll get to study. I was just curious. Uh, John, uh, Federica, anybody, like you guys do a deep dive on this study at all? Guessing not, yeah. Uh, it's a really good question. I I'm not sure, right? Because it is observational data. It's not like this was an experiment and it's 600,000 people. So so yeah, just getting to that drinker versus non-drinker status is probably not trivial. And it, and it could be fraught with uncertainty, right? In that assignment of drinker and non-drinker. Uh, we do know that the authors were aware of these confounding variables uh, that could be distorting the relationship that they want to uncover. Um, again, I'm assuming they had some sort of regression analysis here. I, I didn't didn't look at the nuts and bolts of the procedures, but uh, we know from from the book that they controlled for smoking status, which was one of the main confounders that we're aware of, age, uh, gender, and then there were at least some health indicators that were controlled for, like BMI, the body mass index. And then history of diabetes. I don't know if that was, does the person have diabetes or maybe there's a family history of it for, for diabetes, but so they're at least controlling for a subset of uh, health indicators there. Unfortunately, there are still lingering issues uh, that the study did not control for. Uh, primarily like risk seeking behavior is really difficult to control for. Smoking is in, in an example of risk-seeking behavior, but it's just one example. Um, and so I don't know if we'll address these kind of larger issues later in the book, but but, but yeah, this is, this is a big one that, that's really hard to control for, which is why um, truly having a lot of confidence behind this study is, is difficult. And it's, you know, we have similar issues with like nutrition type studies as well. Um, it's just hard to control for all the, the variables at, at stake. Another item brought out is, well, we removed non-drinkers, um, which has some benefits, um, but we're, we're not just removing the sick and recovering alcoholics. Uh, we're, we're also, you know, removing folks that, that maybe are, are healthy, relatively healthy, but it is possible also that, you know, without looking at the data, like do non-drinkers that are relatively healthy have a higher mortality rate than folks that drink a little bit. Uh, and by removing non-drinkers entirely, you don't really get to explore that, that relationship. It's almost like the authors just kind of assumed um, you know, that portion, that relatively healthy folks that aren't drinkers, um, you, you, you know, it, it's not necessary, not, we, we don't need those folks in our, our, our study to, uh, to establish the, the causal connection here. 
Um, another issue is uh, what if we we have sick people in our study, right? And and, and they just tend to drink less than than the average drinkers. Um, that can be a problem where we could show that maybe mortality is higher for folks that drink less. Um, we, we know the authors are trying to control for some health indicators like BMI um, and diabetes, but there are a host of factors uh, related to health. Like it does, does an individual have cancer currently? Um, it's not clear to me that the authors were able to control for, for items like that, um, which could be highly relevant um, when we're when we're looking at the, the relationships at play here. And, and so uh, just as, as an interesting example, uh, Chris Ald, I don't know if he's an economist or, or someone else, but he read the paper, used similar methodology to say that, well, uh, drinking more causes you to be, to become a man. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think we need to really dive into this. We know that's, that's silly and it, it's not conclusive here, but I, I think the point here is that the, the methodology employed does not rule out all alternative explanations. And because of that, you, you can have some, some strange conclusions, uh, right? Um, these studies are not, not perfect. And, and this is just kind of one where you can come up with some, some interesting uh, results. We are coming up on the hour here. Any last thoughts on this section? All right, I'll try to be really quick here with, with the, the last uh, section called context and omniscience. The, the idea here is just that domain, domain expertise is really important. You need to understand the context uh, of the problem that you're studying, um, which, is, which is goofy. Like you really need to understand reality to understand reality. <laughs> Here's one of the, the sidebars there. You, you can't really go into a problem not knowing anything. You know, you know, earlier on, we talked about a typical data science problem where you, you don't have any underlying assumptions. You just let the data speak for itself. But if you're trying to establish cause and effect, you do need to have baseline assumptions. And you know the, the process to get there um, really follows the scientific process. If you're a researcher, this is kind of commonplace where you're doing a literature review usually before you um, are really designing or engaging in your own research. So, so that happens through talking to other experts, reading relevant books, reading articles. Um, so you, you really understand as much as you can about that DGP um, right be, before you um, try to answer your, your research question. Um, you're never going to know everything, but hopefully you you have a, a good baseline, um, and you're capturing the uh, the, the high level uh, items that are influencing your your, your process here. Um, another uh, interesting point here is that you know it, it's really hard to make uh, high level strides uh, in areas that are completely unchartered. So if we're trying to like. I don't know, prove the existence of aliens or, or, or some strange technology that we know nothing about. It, it, it's really hard to do um, without having that, that baseline of, of uh, research available for us. Um, so I think the point there is the scientific process is very incremental. Um, and you can only hope to really <laughs> make those small strides. And you, know, you do that, and then someone builds off of your own research. Um, uh, particularly when you're dealing with observational data. You, you can't really just leap from point A to point Z. It's it's small steps um, in understanding the, the causal process. Aaron, I don't mean to cut you off, but I do have to hop. Uh, if other yeah. people want to continue, uh, feel free to stay on. But if somebody can hit the stop. Um, just one other uh, reminder is Aaron's going to do Chapter 6 next week. I'm going to do Chapter 7 in two weeks. Um, yeah. And... 
if Aaron, as you wrap up, if you want to kind of give an, if you've reviewed chapter six yet, just kind of some high level, like what, what to kind of expect next week. If not, otherwise, don't worry about it. Otherwise, uh, have a great week and uh, um, I'll see you all next week. But if somebody could please do stop at the end.